Welcome to FO Talks. With me is Gary Grapper again on popular demand. We've discussed the Israel Hamas war, we've discussed the Houthis. Today we will discuss the Middle East yet again. A uh, lot's been going on. Iran has been active. The US has struck Iranian targets. Uh, so, without further ado, Gary, welcome back and paint us a picture of what is going on. Hello, Altoon. It's great to join you again. Um, well, the the situation uh, still uh, continues uh, apace uh, on all fronts, certainly in terms of the military front with Israel's continued onslaught in Gaza. In fact, the most recent news indicates that they're preparing to move on, on uh, Rafa, <clears throat> which is the southernmost town in the Gaza Strip. Uh, virtually right on the border with Egypt. Uh, it's also important to note that a significant portion of the population of Gaza has been concentrated there uh, since, uh, has been moving there and has concentrated there uh, since the start of the war, simply because that was the only safe haven, so to speak, uh, that they had. It's also, of course, very close to the Egyptian border and relatively easier certainly not easy, but easier for humanitarian uh, relief uh, uh, to reach uh, those who are in that area. Uh, so that's it on the, uh, on the Israeli side. Um, on the Hamas side, uh, clearly Hamas is on its back foot, but at this point, certainly not at the point of defeat. Uh, they have suffered extraordinary losses. It's unclear exactly how many actual Hamas fighters have been either killed or captured by the Israelis. Um, various estimates are out there. The Israelis, for example, have uh, suggested as many as half and maybe even more. Uh, there are no other independent assessments insofar as I'm aware. Uh, in fact, the Israelis just announced uh, within the last few days that two-thirds of the Hamas fighting battalions have been neutralized, which is pretty significant. That would mean approximately 18 uh, Hamas battalions. Uh, the tunnel structure in, Hama in, in Gaza is really unclear at the moment. The Israelis from the outset have gone after the tunnels. They represent a point of considerable vulnerability to the Israelis because obviously uh, Hamas has been able to house not only its fighters but its command and control systems there. It's reported that uh, the hostages are being kept there. Their leadership is uh, secluded in the tunnel structure. It's vast. It's larger than the tube system of the uh, of London. And uh, with uh, in increasing reports, it seems uh, it may be even much greater than the Israelis had anticipated. There is, again, a rough estimate that maybe half of the tunnel system has been destroyed, which is certainly not enough to say that they have eliminated the threat from the tunnel system, i.e. that Hamas fighters are no longer able to move from one part of the Gaza Strip to the other through the tunnel system. Uh, the diplomatic front has been quite uh, active uh, with the involvement of the United States, Qatar, Egypt, uh, of course the Israelis, uh, uh, and uh, the, the progress uh, up till about the middle of the week looked very promising. <coughs> In fact, um, Mr. Uh, Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, had gone to uh, uh, Jerusalem to meet with Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, to present what had been uh, the counteroffer of Hamas in these negotiations, which would have basically provided for a, a three-month uh, uh, suspension of the fighting, a phased release of hostages, and perhaps even a movement towards some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, and this sounded pretty promising. It seemed that all the other sides had been in agreement here. There's obviously a major push on the part of the United States and the international community 
to try and reach a ceasefire, given the horrendous toll of lives lost in Gaza, now exceeding 27,000. But uh, the plan as presented by Secretary Blinken to the Prime Minister was rejected. Uh, uh, The Hamas was asking for too much, particularly in the sense of uh, a negotiation at this point in time. uh, uh, The Israelis are not interested in negotiating any kind of a ceasefire or so-called day after with Hamas. So that is the situation as far as uh, Israel and Hamas goes. What we've seen is an expansion of this conflict to the Red Sea, which we've discussed. The Houthis have been attacking shipping. They've practically blocked off the Red Sea route. Uh, The Suez Canal is uh, the northern end of the Red Sea, and uh, Bab el-Mendab is the southern end of the Red Sea. And because the Houthis are close to Bab el-Mendab, the ships um, are going around the Cape of Good Hope adding fuel costs, labor costs, and insurance costs in the process. So that's one spillover. The other spillover was the Iranian proxies attacking and killing U.S. soldiers, and then U.S. responding in a barrage of attacks after warning the Iranians, of course. The Iranians didn't lose uh, uh, many men. Uh, They probably lost uh, some ground capacity, but perhaps not too much. Um, perhaps this is all kabuki, this is all uh, theater to appease hardliners in both capitals. Uh, My question to you is, what happens to the conflict outside Israel and and Hamas? The Houthis, the Iranian proxies, and of course, the US and Iran. This is what is increasingly on the mind of the US administration, as well as minds of leaders uh, around the world at the moment with respect to this conflict. Uh, From the very outset of this conflict uh, on October 7th and uh, through subsequent uh, events, uh, there was great concern about uh, escalation of the conflict. Uh, We're we're talking about the West Bank. We're talking about uh, northern Israel and southern Lebanon with respect to Hezbollah. And then we're talking about militia groups uh, in both uh, eastern Syria and western Iraq, uh, the Houthis, as you mentioned, in Yemen, and consequent uh, uh, fallout in in the Red Sea, and ultimately uh, Iran. Um, And it seems like the major parties want to avoid an expansion of the war without question. Uh, these uh, sporadic attacks, which have become quite frequent, have increased in number and in lethality, uh, the most obvious being the attack on the American outpost in northeastern Jordan that ended ended up uh, taking the lives of three American soldiers. And the subsequent responses, the the quite vigorous response by uh, the United States against these militia groups, particularly the ones in Iraq, and then taking out a senior uh, uh, Qatab Hezbollah leader uh, in the environs of Baghdad, uh, which has raised the ire of the Iraqi government. So uh, I think we have to be clear, the war has escalated. We've been able to avoid, or the combatants have been able to avoid uh, the most serious concern of various parties have, and that is an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah in north of Israel and southern Lebanon. And, and there have been some talks to, to try and ratchet down uh, the, the tensions that are occurring uh, in that area of the Middle East as well. It's important to bear in mind that uh, there have been attacks against Israel and Israel against uh, Hezbollah. Uh, Sometimes uh, they have become quite violent, but it seems like Hezbollah and the Israelis have this invisible line, and and, uh, neither side wants to cross that line and ignite a major conflagration uh, that uh, they had experienced in 2006. Uh, But there's no question. This conflict has escalated. 
It has increasingly occupied uh, the time and the resources of the United States, which is something, of course, the U.S. was hoping to prevent as we turn our attention, as the Americans turn their attention to uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, now coming up on its two-year anniversary, and, uh, of course, uh, the concerns are over China in, uh, in Asia. All right. You've mentioned a number of parties uh, to the conflict, Hezbollah, militant groups in Syria, Western Iraq. Uh, you've mentioned Iran. What are the interests and uh, strategic goals of these various parties? Uh, it may be that some of them don't have strategic goals, they are more tactical, but still it would be good to have a, a lay of the land as to well, who are the various parties involved um, in this conflict or could be involved in this conflict. Uh, it's important to note that uh, among all the members of this uh, axis of resistance, the groups that you just mentioned, uh, headlined by, of course, uh, Iran, uh, they they have not really coordinated or collaborated that closely. Uh, the one sort of glue among them all uh, has been the Iranians and the role that's been played by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, uh, and uh, their preeminent uh, force, the, the Al-Quds force, which is kind of their their crack troop, uh, troops, their, um, their special forces, and uh, they are active in almost all of these areas that we've just mentioned in providing uh, training, uh, advice, facilitating the transfer of weapons, uh, other resources, and certainly money. Uh, and so uh, that's point number one. Uh, point number two is uh, heretofore they haven't coordinated their, um, their military actions that closely if at all. And that was pretty apparent on uh, October 7th, when you would think uh, the uh, with Hamas having taken Israel and its uh, security forces by surprise, the others would have acted at the same time, particularly Hezbollah. They did not. Uh, it turns out that um, none of the parties, including Iran, was aware of the actual timing of uh, the planned Hamas attack on Israel. and the And the Iranians have allowed as much and therefore have delivered a, a tough message to Hamas. You know, if you don't coordinate with us, you don't inform us, you know, we can't be there when you think you might need us. And that probably explains why Hezbollah hasn't jumped into this fray with both feet. Uh, but the one unifying ideological component in all of this is the overriding interest, most especially on the part of Iran, to see the United States out of the Middle East, full stop. And all of these groups, whether it's uh, Iran itself or the Houthis, these militia groups in Syria and Iraq, uh, certainly uh, Hezbollah uh, or Hamas, they all want them out. And then secondly, of course, uh, they would like to see the elimination of the state of Israel. And uh, if you can get the Americans out, uh, the, the, their side of the equation all of a sudden looks far more promising. And therefore, uh, they're, that's, their, that's what's been bringing them uh, together. Um, it's also important to note that uh, all of these organizations, Iran perhaps being the exception, um, these are fighting organizations, every single one of them. They're war fighters. They make war. They disrupt uh, they're very good at fighting. They're very good at combat, whether it's a smaller foe or a larger foe. They're ruthless. Uh, they take little into account by way of human rights or the needs or the wants of the populations where they, where they live and exist. Uh, they're not governing institutions, and that is clearly apparent from Hamas in the 17 years or so that it's controlled Gaza. It's done an abysmal job. It was extremely unpopular in Gaza and providing for the needs of the people of Gaza, whether it's basic services like roads, water, sewer, uh, power and electricity, and, and so forth, uh, the economy has always been uh, almost on a subsistence level. And therefore, uh, it was, there is clear evidence that Hamas was more in, uh, concerned about feathering its own nest 
uh, building up its uh, war material and capabilities in terms of being able to fight Israel and not governing. And the same holds true uh, in various degrees with these groups in Syria and Iraq, the Houthis who have, fair, uh, who have failed abysmally in governing that area of Yemen which they control, and uh, maybe to a somewhat lesser extent in Hezbollah. Hezbollah has done actually a very interesting job of inveigling itself into uh, Lebanese political affairs, uh, now serving in the Lebanese parliament uh, and becoming a very powerful player in, in Lebanese politics. Whether they're actually interested in governing yet is unclear. So these are all fighting organizations. And fundamentally, you could imagine them as uh, uh, medieval bands uh, living off uh, uh, loot, really, of plundering and pillaging, uh, perhaps not raping, but Maybe even that sometimes, October 7th, they certainly were. Uh, and if that is so, then the incentive for them is to keep a certain level of violence up because it's rent-seeking in some ways. It is, it is plunder in some ways to continue with their increase in power and uh, leverage and relevance. No, absolutely. In, in fact, if you look at the genesis of these various organizations, each one has arose in circumstances of uh, instability uh, or a, a failed or failing state, every single one of them. If you look at the establishment of uh, Hezbollah, which occurred during the Lebanese Civil War, uh, in the uh, which started in 1975 and lasted until 1990, and until that point was the most devastating uh, 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 war uh, in in the Middle East uh, in the modern era. That is post World War II. So, yeah. uh, and and you could argue that is a classic example of uh, a strategic blunder uh, by Israel because Israel went in, they supported the Christian militias, they overestimated the importance and, and uh, relevance and clout of these uh, Christian militias. They forgot to take into account demography. And even people who've retired from the Mossad confess that it was a strategic uh, misjudgment on their part. Oh, yes. And, um, and of course, Israel was entirely focused on the threat uh, that uh, the, uh, well, in, in this case, it was the uh, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, yes. and and the fighting and the fighters who were associated with that, and the attacks that they had launched against Israel, without a broader view, as you've just mentioned, of the circumstances in Lebanon at the time, and uh, Hezbollah uh, was created right at that very moment. So, for our viewers and listeners. Um, very quick uh, up briefing about uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization because some of the young people listening to us, especially the ones doing their undergrad in, in American universities like Harvard, Columbia, Yale, etc., uh, they believe that the world was born with the internet. So maybe maybe a little bit of an education, Gary, from someone like you about the PLO, its adoption of terror, Munich, etc., would be useful. <laughs> the uh, the political uh, the the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization was at one time considered a terrorist or organization and was responsible for some some pretty uh, pretty violent acts. Um, but things began to change in the mid nineteen eighties uh, when uh, Yasser Arafat, uh, then the recognized leader of the Palestinian Liberation Movement, uh, was willing to. Uh, uh, basically accept the existence of the state of Israel and negotiate with the Israelis and on the other hand um, request that the Israelis acknowledge the PLO as being uh, the only negotiating organization representative of the Palestinian people. And uh, that later gave birth to, uh, uh, to Hamas. Hamas did not accept Yasser Arafat's decision to move in this direction. And of course, yes, uh, uh, Arafat's willing to, to do this opened up uh, Palestinian relations 
uh, with the United States for the first time uh, and began this process that ultimately led to uh, Oslo in the early uh, 1990s. Uh, but if you go just a little further back when the PLO was uh, a much isolated and ostracized, condemned uh, or organization, they carried out some pretty violent terrorist acts, uh, including, for example, in Khartoum, Sudan, um, when they um, invaded the home of the Saudi ambassador who happened to be hosting um, a diplomatic event at his home. And the, um, the American ambassador, his deputy, several other diplomats were taken hostage. The ambassador and his deputy, and I believe a Bel senior Belgian diplomat, uh, were killed. And so that earned the PLO increasing animus. Throughout this period, the PLO had taken up residence in Jordan. And uh, to the point that they were, they had created effectively a state within a state. They were in issuing their own travel documents. They had their own security force. They controlled their own territory within Jordan. And that situation was, uh, became increasingly untenable not just for King Hussein, but for Jordanian security forces. And they reach the end of their tolerance for this situation, and they launched a very bitter and bloody campaign against the Palestinians in Jordan. Uh, this gave rise to the term Black September. It was, I think, September 1980 or 1981. And uh, they forced the evacuation of the PLO completely out of Jordan. And the PLO, Yasser Arafat and all, went to Lebanon, mostly southern Lebanon, where, where they created a state within a state yet again. Yes, <laughs> they did it again. And this time, the, it was not the Lebanese who were going to expel them. It was the Christian phalangists uh, who later married up with the uh, Israelis, and that gave rise to um, uh, the the start of the Lebanese uh, civil war, which uh, ended very tragically for the people of Lebanon uh, in terms of devastating what had been probably the most prosperous uh, economy in all of the Middle East, uh, the closest uh, country uh, in, uh, in the Middle East to a standard and stable middle-income country. And uh, Ultimately, the PLO was forced then to evacuate uh, under the protection of the United States, as well as uh, several other members of the coalition forces. Uh, they included Britain, France, and Italy, and they were all evacuated lock, stock, and barrel from Lebanon to Tunisia. And that really didn't stop their, their, their activities. Uh, there, of course, was the famous uh, Munich Olympic incidents with member of the PLO uh, were able to uh, infiltrate the Olympic Village and capture members of the Israeli Olympic team and ended up killing a pretty fair number of these members before they were um, finally uh, subdued by the German authorities. Uh, their a plane, of a plane hijackings, uh, in one case of a hijacking of uh, a cruise ship as well. Uh, so there were some pretty violent acts that were committed by the, the, the PLO. And it was during that period in Tunisia when they were pretty removed from um, the area of interest that I think Arafat uh, began to size up you know, his standing and the standing of the PLO. And if they were going to have any relevance at all, they were going to have to find a way to get back into a genuine discussion, negotiation with the Israeli side, uh, Israeli side and other parties in, in the conflict. And that, of course, led in the mid-late 1980s to Arafat finally um, accepting and acknowledging the existence of the state of Israel. So this detour is important, not just because history is important and at Fair Observer we are very keen on giving you context. It's important because many strategists, especially those with longer memories uh, in numerous countries, fear that Israel could be committing a repeat of its Lebanon adventure. Then the Palestinian Liberation Organization was conducting a lot of hijackings or skyjackings, 
as the term was in some cases. In fact, Bibi Netanyahu, the current prime minister, lost his brother in the famous um, Entebbe rescue mission uh, in which Mossad got all the information and Sarat Matkal, the elite commando unit in which Bibi Netanyahu served and, of course, his brother served before him, um, conducted and Bibi's brother led the mission and it was a very successful mission. And there was one casualty, and that was his brother. And uh, that sort of violence and that sort of prolonged campaign of terror led Israeli troops to move into Lebanon. And in the early days, they felt as if they were achieving victory. And in the case of uh, Gaza right now, Israel seems to be succeeding, of course, at great cost in terms of lives, in terms of, in terms of both blood and treasure. In fact, uh, Israeli central bank governor saw warning that uh, you know, Israel, uh, Israel growth figures will take a hit. Maybe the balance of payments will take will be in crisis, and so on and so forth. But the point is, there is real fear that Israel could be repeating the same mistake as it did against the PLO in Lebanon. Um, over to you, Gary, uh, as trying to just bring the context of the, the reference to the PLO. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think it's commonly recognized that in case of the early 1980s, when uh, Israel went into Lebanon, that it was an ill-considered uh, decision at, at the time. Um, the the 2006 conflict between Hezbollah and and, and Israel is is considerably different. Uh, however, uh, that particular war was sparked by a raid by Hezbollah fighters into northern Israel that took the lives of, of a handful of um, Israeli troops. I don't I don't think it was more than five. It may have been fewer, and Israel responded with an iron fist, just came down with both feet and uh, um, began to bombard southern Lebanon uh, with with its uh, fighter aircraft. And uh, that really launched a full-fledged war. And uh, the war lasted a little over a month, I I believe. I can't recall the the exact period of time. uh, certainly uh, a much shorter conflict than uh, what is now involved in in Gaza. Um, uh, both sides, however, um, took some lessons from that. Um, uh, less than a year after that conflict had been started, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, acknowledged publicly, it was in a media interview, uh, that had he known the consequences of uh, the actions of that Hezbollah raid into northern Israel, he would never have launched it uh, because of the devastating result that it had not only on the Hezbollah or- organization, and I'm talking real concrete uh, uh, deaths and, and destruction, uh, but also politically it suffered a great deal because it, that war wreaked such havoc on Lebanon. Um, it was truly devastating for for Lebanon and for Hezbollah, and it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Mr. Nasrallah wants to avoid instigating a conflict of the same nature. Not that it prevents him. Sorry to interrupt. The 2006 conflict was a success for Israel. Well, um, it all depends on who who you talk to. Um, it was a success for Israel because they inflicted because Israel inflicted such uh, widespread destruction and damage. I mean, it, it it did not kill or eliminate Hezbollah, and from that perspective, many people in the Middle East viewed the war as a victory for Hezbollah. Hezbollah had stood up to the Israeli war machine, the first one, first Arab fighting organization to have done that. That that's actually not true, but nevertheless, um, and it was hailed as a victory. Hassan Nasrallah saw it a little differently since he was on the inside. 
But nevertheless, it was it was hailed throughout the Middle East as a great victory and emblematic of what Arabs were capable of doing with genuine will and commitment and and forces and the, and the ideological backing um, from the Israeli side, as I said, the, the losses, at, as in virtually every conflict in which uh, Israel has been involved, were very lopsided on the, on, on the side of, um, of whoever was fighting Israel. Uh, Israel did not suffer anywhere near the losses that uh, Hezbollah had. But there was this political loss that was felt because they had failed to eliminate Hezbollah. And why is that important? Um, we, we, we've heard of uh, Bibi Netanyahu's rejection of the various proposals for a suspension and the fighting in Gaza uh, that would last anywhere from six weeks to, to 12 weeks and probably some in between. And I think what is very much on his mind and the minds of other key leaders in the Israeli establishment is the 2006 war, that they had failed to finish the job and as a result, they now confront a major power just across their border in the north that is armed with 150,000 rockets and missiles and untold numbers of uh, drones, uh, some of which are precision guided and therefore can wreak considerable havoc and destruction within the state of Israel, and now present a challenge of a much different nature than they did in 2006. Um, and this is a result of the failure to complete the job, in their view, of 2006. And so uh, that is why I, I think that the Israelis will be digging their heels in when it comes to these various proposals for ceasefires or suspension in the fighting and so forth, because they do not want to see the recrudescence of uh, Hezbollah like opposition force across its southern border, which it effectively has had uh, since 2007, if not before. Um, they truly want to eliminate Hamas, both as a military organization and as a governing organization in Gaza, which, of course, they did not do in the 2006 war against Hezbollah. So, so much so for the various um, parties and their interests. What are the biggest risks? What are the biggest geopolitical risks from this conflict? Well, this war is touching. Uh, I mean, it's clear it, it's impacted the entire region now. Uh, virtually every single country in the Middle East is engaged in some fashion, certainly not in the actual combat, but in, in addressing the fallout from, from this war. <coughs> Excuse me. What I what I think is particularly noteworthy is that um, Iran and its um, its its uh, Houthi um, militia resistance organization in Yemen have succeeded, maybe not intentionally, but effectively, in nearly globalizing this economy, uh, this uh, this conflict. And I say that because. Um, as we have discussed before, the Red Sea is a major thoroughfare for global trade, particularly between Europe and Asia, and specifically Europe and China. Uh, and it's relied upon by, by multiple populations uh, in, those two, in those two areas. And it's severely disrupted the economics of this two-way trade uh, between Europe and Asia. Uh, adding costs. You add costs, prices at the consumer level go up, prices go up, that leads to inflation. Are we talking about market increase uh, inflation in these areas? Um, probably not, but nevertheless, uh, anytime you eat into businesses' profits, it's something that they take note of and try to correct. But in this particular case, there's not a whole lot businesses could do uh, in terms of bringing um, uh, stability back to the Red Sea. And what is noteworthy about this is that the Houthis, and by extension the Iranians, are able to do this with chump change. It's not costing them very much at all. 
In fact, think about this. All they have to really do is be able to launch a few drones, which cost, depending on how many add-ons you had on, uh, on under these drones, anywhere from four hundred to maybe a thousand dollars if you get the super deluxe BMW version. And uh, they don't have to do much destruction. All they have to do is impact any one of the many cargo or tanker vessels transiting the Red Sea. That catches the attention of the shipping companies. And all of a sudden, they're looking at rerouting these vessels around the Cape of Good Hope. And you have the resulting increase in cost to them and so forth. Uh, and so now we're seeing a global impact of this conflict. So supply chain uh problems and inflation are back? Potentially, yes. Now, we're still in the early throes of this, um, and therefore we're not seeing uh, uh, the, the effects significantly, but the longer this continues, uh, the greater this threat is going to be. Um, like, uh, where it impacts the economy of uh, Western countries, most especially North America and Latin America, uh, is a completely unrelated event. And that is the United States can trade with Europe and and Asia without ever having to deal with um, either the Strait of Hormuz or the Suez Canal, although we do receive a very small amount of oil now from the Middle East that, that would have to go through there. But we have alternative. The United States has alternative sources, including right on our border with our our Canadian friends to the north. Uh, but uh, coincidentally, there is a drought in Central America, particularly in the area of the Panama Canal. The canal level is down significantly, which has forced the Panamanians who, who operate and control the canal to reduce the traffic going through the canal. That's going to have an impact on the United States. And for the Americans, uh, the Canadians and, and others who have relied on that route, they're going to have to look for alternative routing. But wait, look, we have this problem in the Red Sea. Um, so uh, the impact is not immediate. And the longer uh, the conflict continues, the more apparent this impact is going to become. So let's look at the economic impact of this development. A lot of European diplomats have said off the record repeatedly that uh, they may be looking at a lost decade ahead. Russian energy now costs an arm and a leg. China is suffering from deflation. The U.S. has turned protectionist. The U.S. even has a fully fleshed industrial policy. And what happens to them when the Israel-Hamas war further pushes up costs to their economy. They import a lot from Asia, particularly China. And what happens when um, confidence in the global economy and most of their trade suddenly has a bottleneck, when the confidence drops and the trade has a bottleneck. So really, it's Europe being hit, not just by a triple whammy, but maybe uh, a quadruple value, a quintuple value now. Uh, well, history tells us that when, when these um, feelings begin to grip individuals in countries around the world, concerns about instability, concerns about their own personal economic situation, uh, they end up being manifested in the decisions they make in terms of the political leadership. It can can clearly give rise to um, uh, very conservative, uh, even autocratic leaders who uh, are able to campaign very easily on the promise that they alone can fix things. Uh, they know how to do this, uh, particularly in, in countries that have significant military forces. Um, history has also shown that when you deprive economies of critical inputs, Oil is the most obvious, but it's not the only one. Now, today, we would have to talk about microchips. It's extremely in, uh, important for any growing economy, um, even second-tier uh, countries. Now, uh, if, they're not in, in, uh, if they're not consuming 
products that contain microchips, which is <laughs> impossible to imagine since they're uh, they're they're omnipresent. Um, they may be involved in the production or interested in moving in the areas of production of microchips. So when you deprive economies of these critical inputs to their economies, they will become more aggressive. And we saw this in the lead up to World War I, and we especially saw it in the lead up to World War II, as both uh, Germany and Japan uh, sought new sources for uh, oil and other critical minerals that they needed for their economies and for their war machines. Now, I, I don't think we're, we're, we're near that point now, but we need to be aware of this, uh, that this sort of protectionism, uh, which prompts this aggressive response, uh, can be very destabilizing and, and can create its own dynamic uh, that will be very difficult to control. And, and I think that's cause for some concern. I, I think we're a long way from that. But don't forget, uh, in addition to this conflict, we have an ongoing conflict of uh, one aggressor, Russia, uh, invading uh, an independent democratic uh, nation that posed no threat to Russia, Ukraine. And uh, that war is ongoing. It shows no signs of ending, although some people are entertaining the view that somehow uh, uh, Putin can negotiate or is willing to negotiate and into that war, I think he's feeling uh, far more strengthened today than he has been in at least a year. Uh, and so we should expect that war, as long as the Ukrainians are willing to resist, uh, to continue. Uh, and uh, I, lot, I think a lot in terms of that war will hinge on the American election this November. All right. So, so much so for Russia-Ukraine war. Let's wrap up with... Uh and looking at uh, the Israel-Hamas war, you said uh, Europe is likely to see a rise in authoritarian tendencies. Well, we have Robert Fico, who's won in Slovakia. Viktor Orban has been ruling Hungary. The Freedom Party is on the rise in Austria. Hirt Wilders uh, has the biggest party in the Dutch parliament. He's very powerful. And the AFD is riding in the polls. It's polling a third in many states or landers of Germany. Um, Europe is clearly shifting to the right, even to the far right. Uh, at the same time, now, uh, there, there is talk of uh, the U.S. adopting a more aggressive military position vis-a-vis Iran, and, and of course within the U.S. there is the countervailing domestic strife. We published an article on this by a very young high school student uh, about the campus force, one set of people supporting the Palestinian cause, another set of people supporting the Israeli cause. So to me, it almost seems like pre-World War I, there was so much tension. The suffragists wanted to vote. Uh, there were people who wanted land reform. Uh, there were others um, who wanted national liberation. And no big power in particular really wanted war, but they all ended up drifting to war. It took Gavrilo Princess uh, shot that killed the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for that entire edifice to unravel. So are we sleepwalking into yet another big conflict? Um, I think all the parties are well aware of the consequences of uh, a global con conflagration, such as we saw twice in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and as a result, uh, we'll try to prevent that. Uh, but... Um, it, it, it's a sign of how events uh, take on a life of their own and, and leaders seem uh, constrained by th these events uh, to respond in a certain specific way, uh, usually with harshness. And that's the famous, the the famous comment by a former British prime minister, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and, and Abraham Lincoln, uh, one of our greatest presidents, uh, 
uh, acknowledged that he, he had these grandiose ideas of how he was going to lead the United States. And in the end, he acknowledged that um, it was events that pretty much drove his decision making. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, I, I, I think we just need to be aware that today the situation is much different. We have uh, nuclear weapons, which uh, um, were they to be used would create a, a war no, uh, or a, a, an earth, a planet that no one wants to live in. Uh, and so I, I think that's a major inhibiting factor of the great powers uh, uh, engaging again uh, in direct conflict. Uh, secondly, however, and this is something um, that was less of a concern prior to World War I and World War II, and all of these non-state actors who are sowers of chaos, as I said before, so many of them are fighting organizations. They're war-fighting organizations. They live to fight. I mean, uh, listen uh, or read uh, the Houthi rhetoric or, uh, or some of the comments being made by uh, militia leaders in Syria or Iraq. Um, they, they have no governing plan and clearly no interest in governing. It's not clear if they ha have any idea what kind of governance they want. I mean, uh, folk, uh, organizations like Hamas uh, uh, certainly claim that they want to see an Islamic state, a la uh, uh, the one that ISIS, also known as the Islamic State, wanted to create, a caliphate, so to speak, uh, not only in the land of Palestine, but throughout the Middle East and even globally. And so, uh, but beyond that, they, 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 they really can't articulate very clearly the kind of governing system that they want. And, and that's shared by these uh, organizations around the world who are not necessarily controlled by governments, and that holds for the axis of resistance. Uh, Iran advises them, uh, trains them, funds them, uh, and uh, arms them. But uh, it's not clear that it is capable that Iran can actually dictate to them. I, I would hedge that uh, statement by uh, by saying Hezbollah is is a case by itself, because that is a strategic asset. At least Iran view, uh, views Hezbollah as a strategic a strategic as, asset to protect Iran itself against a possible attack by Israel by arming Hezbollah immediately uh, across the border from Israel. Uh, so uh, these groups can create considerable uh, instability. Uh, and they don't have any of the guardrails that um, establish governments, such as the United States, any European government, China, or even Russia has. So, to sum up what you've said, is that the great powers have historical memory and they will try their best to pull back from a catastrophic global war. However, there are agents of chaos, like the medieval assassins, <laughs> I see she who might uh, stir the pot. Uh, absolutely. And um, just to compound uh, the problems of the current situation, um, with the exception of the United States and its uh, principal allies, all of these adversaries are led by autocrats. Uh, Russia, China, Iran. Um, you could even throw North Korea into the mix if you'd like because uh, they can certainly wreak havoc in, in Asia, given the presence of nuclear weapons uh, in that country. And therefore, um, uh, autocrats very often are unpredictable. They're opportunists. And uh, the United States and its allies uh, are faced with a very, very difficult uh, situation uh, in, in terms of how can you deal with an autocrat? particularly when they feel compelled to exercise their power, or if they see an opportunity, which in fact may not be one, but they see it as an opportunity to advance their personal interest, as opposed to the interest of their respective nations. But Gary, a lot of uh, analysts are pointing out that democracies themselves have become unpredictable. Democracies themselves are particularly vulnerable to take over by demagogues, and the processes and guardrails in democracies have suffered to such a degree that you have a concentration of executive power. 
And so you look at the UK, a place where I studied, a place you know well. The UK has fifth prime minister in how many years? Three, four. Um, and it's yo-yoing. You get Boris Johnson promising infrastructure. Then you get this new chap who was Boris's lackey saying no infrastructure, the train route, uh, train that was going north. Its final leg is now axed. Uh, you have seen that particularly in the U.S., where in the U.S. has signed international treaties. One president signs it, the other pulls out. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, which a number of people from your community, the former State Department diplomats, many of whom who worked on it, were very upset that Trump just threw it out uh, the moment he got elected. Apparently, that was a decade or more of work. So what we are seeing is a world where even democracies are not what they used to be. So it's a uh, it's a far more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The VUCA world is uh, many people in the Pentagon like to to say, and they love jargon. I don't, but I think that expression has value because it's not as binary as democracy versus autocracy. Democracies themselves are under tremendous strain, which is perhaps why, A, people are turning to strongmen and demagogues, and B, why autocracies have this chance. Uh, unquestionably, in, in almost any country, uh, certainly in, in the United States, when these undercurrents of instability, uncertainty, particularly economic un uncertainty, but also both personal security and uh, national security are running at a feverish pitch or near feverish pitch, uh, there is this inclination to turn toward, quote, strong man. And uh, it, it, it's happened here in the United States, but uh, uh, we, I, I don't think we've, we've ever seen um, anything of the likes of, uh, of Donald Trump. Uh, but he really represents this undercurrent of instability instability, dissatisfaction, unsettledness. I think that's a pretty apt word to describe uh, the feelings of many Americans, despite that the American economy is doing far, far better than any economy in the world right now by, by any measure. It, it truly is, uh, given all the predictions uh, of just a year ago, remarkable how well the American economy is doing now. Uh, unemployment is at historic lows. Uh, inflation has dropped now to uh, well below 4% and by some measures has already reached the 2% level, which was the target of the Fed. Um, uh, uh, people are, uh, there are fewer people on jobless rolls. Uh, incomes are rising, uh, particularly this past year. We have saw, um, uh, I think it was something like a 4 to 5% uh, w uh, in increase in real wages. And so on the e economic side, you would think Americans would have the least to complain about, uh, certainly as compared to their uh, European compatriots uh, or what is occurring right now in China. Uh, but there is this unsettledness right now, and, and I think it's, it's partly global, uh, the, the global sit, uh, situation, and, and it's partly that uh, they can't be sure. I mean, everyone wants to be sure of the future. I mean, this is a, a, a fault of being a human being. We, we want to be certain of our futures. You know, that's why we save. That's why we get insurance. We, we want a knowable future. We can plan our lives. We can, we can plan the next vacation. We plan to send our children to, uh, to school and to college and universities and so forth. Um, and now there's, there's less, less certainty about being able to do that um, in this country and in countries around the world. And, and that creates... Uh, a very fertile grounds for autocrats to step forward and say, I can take control of this and, and fix it. And, and we've heard them actually say that here in uh, the United States as well as other countries. Uh, right now, uh, in the United States does not have the strongest candidates, that is leadership, to present to the public as we move toward uh, our election in November. That creates uncertainty. Um, the U.S., uh, had overwhelmingly committed to the support of uh, the Ukrainians in, in the battle to save their country and preserve their sovereignty and uh, independence. Uh, but, heck, 
we didn't expect to have to do it for so long. I mean, this is a lot of money. That I mean, relatively speaking, it's not much at all. But nevertheless, in the calculus of your average American person, they start to wonder, well, is this really worth it when, well, Ukraine is so far away, whether Russia takes Ukraine or not uh, is not so important to my real everyday le- uh, uh, needs. I would disagree with that, but nevertheless, that's, that's their point of view. Um, there's, uh, of course, the great uncertainty now caused by the conflict in the Middle East, and there are ongoing concerns about the other major superpower in the world, China, and what it may do um, in, in, uh, in the South China Sea and in the, uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So uh, all of these things create, uh, all of these factors contribute to this level of unsettledness. It's certainly very, very, very present uh, in the United States. I think it is throughout Europe and probably East Asia as well. Um, um, it's unclear how Chinese and Russians may feel because we can't, there's no reliable polling on, on how people see things in those two countries, uh, particularly when uh, they are limited in terms of the amount of information they, they receive. I want to add one final comment here, Atul, which I think is vitally important. We have not commented about the information space. There is an ongoing war. There is an ongoing war, global war, in the information space. And, of course, you have the same alignment of, of countries in terms of Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. You can throw in a few other um, minor players in there, Belarus uh, and um, maybe um, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Not that they're uh, uh, significant players to any degree. No, no, but uh, there are other players who are more sophisticated. Come on, Gary. Qatar is playing the information. Well, game. they all are, but, uh, but in a very different way, very yeah. different way than Russia or China. Uh, that's true. And very different. Very, very different. So you, you, th- that's a different category. Um, and they are basically looking at, um, at uh, trying to balance the equation as they now see it in terms of uh, the great powers. Um, and uh, so the, the information space is not governable. We know that um, virtually anyone, anywhere, where with a mobile phone is a is a player, is a combatant, if you want to even use that term, in the information space. And therefore, uh, people are bombarded with all sorts of information and very often with the inability to determine uh, to, to separate truth from fiction and outright fabrication and exaggeration and so forth. And of course, it all gets repeated again and again. And some of this, of course, now with uh, AI is artificially uh, uh, fabricated. And it can't, it, to this point in time, it, it's really not controllable. Uh, and it adds to, again, this level of uncertainty and unsettledness that people feel around the world uh, in terms of, well, what's true now? How do I know? And very often they fall back on their personal biases. That's the only thing they have left. And, and social media exacerbates them because you filter bubbles and echo chambers. So if you like one video of, say, Hamas fighters, then it's going to feed you every related video. And maybe soon you'll graduate from Hamas to Hezbollah and Houthis. But you're in that echo chamber and nothing else exists. Without any question. I mean, the algorithms are written to tap in to every individual's personal bias. I don't care whether it's a product they want to buy, a service they need to use, or a political affiliation of one sort or another, or a cultural point of view, social point of view, whatever it might be, the algorithms are there to feed your bias. And it creates uh, this infinite number of echo chambers uh, where people Ultimately, because they're so uncertain of all the information that's out there, what may be true or not, they fall back on their biases, which locks them in to this echo chamber, which ultimately ends up exacerbating uh, this uncertainty and unsettledness. Um, I, I don't have a clear answer to that. I'm certainly not an expert when it, when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, information uh, and the information warfare 
that is now taking place at virtually every level, uh, but it is a major factor to consider as we look at instability, as we look at this conflict in the Middle East, as we look at the uh, Russian invasion uh, of, of Ukraine, as we look at tensions between China and the United States, China and Taiwan, um, ongoing civil war in Sudan, which is not often mentioned, but is producing far greater numbers of refugees. Eight million, perhaps. Eight million people have been ousted from their homes. So we're living in a, in a very uncertain time. And when you were speaking about information, uh, there's a chap called Vladislav Surkin who will go down as the great uh, dark geniuses of this age. And in many ways, he's managed to create a post-truth world. Uh, and of course, let's not forget, uh, there are spin doctors in the US and UK who started this entire practice, which has, of course, been mastered now well, we in have the land networks. of the KGV. We have entire networks in the United States who are who are um, very instrumental leaders in stirring this pot. Um, I, I didn't even mention uh, another dimension to this unsettledness that people feel around the world. Let's not forget climate change. And that's a long term struggle that the entire planet faces. And um we still don't have our act together, uh, aside from wonderful statements being made by leaders and environmentalists. Uh, we're, we're still not making many inroads. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, uh, in Sudan, part of the reason there is conflict is the fact that uh, there's a shortage of water. And a lot of times it is villages, communities, ethnicities fighting for watering holes. Um, two statistics, and then, of course, we'll bring this to an end. Um, 90% of Lake Chad is dry. The population has been going up. Water has been going down. And to bring it back, to loop back um, to the Middle East, where the conflict is on, the Middle East and North Africa region is the most water-stressed region in the world. And part of the tension between Palestinians and Israelis is about water. Israelis get a disproportionately higher uh, amount of water, and the Palestinians do not, or at least they claim they do not get enough. And in Gaza, in particular, um, they've had problems with water, electricity, and everything else. And there is a very strong feeling on the Palestinian side, that they are victims of apartheid. On the Israeli side, they say that the water Queen Rania uses to wash her face is actually coming from Israeli technology. So, uh, yet again, the Middle East, one land, two different narratives. <laughs> uh, no question. Of course, this is um, not unique in history. I, I uh, tell my students that prior to the uh, Syrian civil war, which broke out, in 2011, uh, there had been a six, seven year drought in many of the agricultural producing areas of Syria, which prompted many of uh, the residents of those areas, most of whom were farmers or involved in food production in, in some, some fashion uh, for the rest of the country to migrate to the cities, um, whether it's Damascus, Humps, Aleppo, and so forth. Um, uh, but they didn't have the skills to survive in, in those cities. But, I mean, they were farmers, agricultural workers of, uh, in, uh, in some way. And, um, and so you had large populations who were, who were not able to sustain themselves in these cities. Um, the, the country itself did not provide uh, services to support these individuals. And it shouldn't be su a surprise to anyone that it led to increasing uh, tensions with the economic stresses that it created and was certainly a vital part of the uprising that took place in Syria starting in 2011, which triggered uh, that devastating civil war. The population of Gaza, if I remember correctly, in 1967, when Israel took this territory from Egypt, was 350,000. 
possible, but today it is estimated to be 2.3 million, certainly above 2 million. There you go. Lots of people, not enough land, and of course, all the stresses that already existed are suddenly a lot stronger. Certainly no, no disagreement. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, given the entrenched views of both sides, uh, that is Hamas and Israel, at this particular moment in the conflict, um, it's difficult to, uh, to imagine um, how this may end. Um, uh, but I, I, I may want to end on, on this point, and that is that um, uh, I, I think the United States and some of the moderate Arab countries uh, with which it is working actually do see the, the, the imperative to bring this conflict to an end that, uh, uh, that satisfies the security needs of the people of Israel, uh, but, the, but the more urgent and humanitarian needs of the people of Gaza right now, which is why I think they are committed uh, to finding a way to at least bring about a suspension in, in the fighting and perhaps an ultimate end to the conflict. Um, but again, the, uh, the political and security um, uh, views of the leaderships of the two sides are going to be very difficult to satisfy at the same time. But I, I give credit to those who are working hard to find a way to do that. Uh, the countries that I mentioned, uh, Qatar, Egypt, I think the Saudi Arabia has certainly offered um, some very interesting uh, initiatives to consider from the Israeli perspective, uh, and then, of course, the, the United States. So if getting Yitzhak Rabin and uh, Yasser Arafat to dance together was hard, it's going to be a bit harder to get Bibi and Hamas to waltz or tango. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it has been fantastic having Gary over. Please like um, our YouTube channel, leave a comment, send us questions, tell us what else you'd like us to cover. And until next time, thank you very much, Gary. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. My pleasure at all. Thank you for having me, Atul. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.